Welcome everyone. This is lecture 34 of the series on fluids and electrolytes. The lectures are based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon. I will provide the link below. We are still in Chapter 5, Hypomagnesemia and Hypermagnesemia. We are still discussing hypomagnesemia. What about genetic hypomagnesemia? This is not very common, but it is very interesting from a pathophysiology standpoint, and also you can see questions on any exam. Genetic magnesium disorders originate either in the kidneys or in the GI tract. So if they originate in the kidney, they are either in the thick ascending limb, tal, or the distal convoluted tubule. Now, GI causes of hypomagnesemia are due to TRIP M6 gene mutations and are very rare. We said uh, we have uh, the two channels, TRIP M6 and TRIP M7, uh, through which uh, we have absorption of magnesium in the small intestine. So if we have a trip M6 mutation, we can have genetic hypomagnesemia because it does not get absorbed, but this is very rare. Examples of genetic hypomagnesemia in the thick ascending limb include Parter syndrome, and they are several types, one, two, three, and four. And also there is a disorder uh, that is not common, but it is important to know, especially for the pediatric uh, nephrologist or the pediatrician. Uh, it is called familial hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. And it comes in two types, type one and type two. Now it is a long name, but really now you know what the disease is all about. You, it is familial, so it is genetic. And you have hypomagnesemia, you have hypercalciuria, so high urine calcium. And because of high urine calcium, you are going to have calcifications in the kidneys or nephrocalcinosis, and it has two types. Barter syndrome, uh, we talked about that when we talked about hypokalemia because it causes hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So it causes sodium wasting. Therefore, blood pressure is never high in Barter syndrome. Actually, if anything, you can have uh, blood pressure on the low side. So you have hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. So on a test question, if you have hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, this and that, and metabolic acidosis, think of diarrhea, okay? Don't answer Barter syndrome. You have high renin and high aldosterone level, and the defective protein depends on the type. Is it type 1, 2, 3, or 4? For example, in type 4 Barter syndrome, it is Barton. Now, with familial hypomagnesemia, with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis, it is either due to defective claudine-16 or claudine-19. We, uh, we said that in the uh, thick ascending limb, claudine-16 and claudine-19 form a tight junction protein. Both are tight, tight junction protein, so they form a complex through which magnesium and calcium, I have to add, pass. And... Um, now, the defect can be either in claudine-16, and this will cause type 1, or claudine-19, which causes type 2. So the problem is with the paracellular reabsorption of magnesium in the thick ascending limb. Now, both types cause nephrocalcinosis and subsequently renal failure, but you distinguish them because type 2 has ocular abnormality. So on a test question, if they give you all the manifestations and they say that the child has some kind of eye problems, then the answer would be type 2 FHHNC. Now, other examples of genetic hypomagnesemia involve hypomagnesemia due to problems in the distal convoluted tubule. Here we have Gittelman syndrome. We've said, and I've said that many, many times, that the picture of Barter syndrome, it is like taking a loop diuretic. So you're going to have hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, metabolic alkalosis, and urine calcium is going to be high. Now, Gittelman syndrome is due to a defect in the sodium chloride co-transporter, also known as NCC. So it is like taking a thiazide diuretic. 
What happens when you take a thiazide diuretic? You're going to have hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, metabolic alkalosis, but hypocalciuria. This is very critical in distinguishing these two syndromes. Gittleman, urine calcium is low. Barter, urine calcium is high. But in both cases, you have sodium wasting, you have salt craving, and blood pressure is on the low side. Now, hypomagnesemia with secondary hypocalcemia, HSH, is due to defective TRIP-M6. So this is also rare. Isolated recessive hypomagnesemia, IRH, is due to defective epidermal growth factor. And this is also very rare. What about symptoms and complications of hypomagnesemia? The symptoms depend on the severity of hypomagnesemia. So when magnesium is below 1.2 milligram per deciliter, you're going to have more symptoms and how fast magnesium dropped. Now, it's very important to know that low magnesium can cause low potassium and low calcium. Why? We said magnesium blocks the ROMK channel. So when you have low magnesium, Potassium is going to be excreted more in the urine, so you get hypokalemia. Also, we said that severe and profound hypomagnesemia is going to suppress PTH, the parathyroid hormone. This is going to cause hypocalcemia. So these three things go together, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, and hypocalcemia. Now, many patients have nonspecific symptoms like you would see with any electrolyte disorder, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, poor appetite, malaise. But hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia in particular can cause neuromuscular symptoms because you get hyperexcitability of the neuromuscular junction. So here in particular, you can get tetany, cramps, weakness, dysphagia, even muscular facilitations, fasciculations. Now, Trousseau and Trostic signs like, uh, like you see in hypocalcemia can also be seen as well. And we'll talk about those signs more when we talk about hypocalcemia in the next chapter. Now, neurological manifestations can also include agitation, psychosis, depression, tremors, vertigo, and nystagmus, but low magnesium has to be severe. Now, if magnesium continues to be untreated, you can reach the stage of delirium, encephalopathy, and even seizures. Cardiac arrhythmias are very important and they require emergency treatment. So you put the patient on telemetry and you give magnesium intravenously. Now, what can you get with severe hypomagnesemia? Ventricular arrhythmias, supraventricular tachycardia, and the very well-known torsade de point. And cardiologists know about that and uh, they would like very much to keep magnesium therapeutic in uh, cardiac patients, especially post-MI, those who are prone to arrhythmia. So the first thing they check is potassium and magnesium and they make sure that they are replete. Hypomagnesemia enhances sensitivity to digoxin toxicity, the same thing you see in hyperkalemia. Hypomagnesemia has been associated with numerous chronic problems. So when it's chronic, also it can cause problems. It's been associated with osteoporosis, migraine headaches, increased insulin resistance, hypertension, asthma, and even atherosclerosis. How do we diagnose hypomagnesemia? Well, we just check serum magnesium, but we need to have a high index of suspicion. Again, magnesium is usually not included in regular chemistry panels. When you order a basic metabolic panel, you don't get magnesium. You have to order it separately. Now, when we see hypomagnesemia, we look at the potassium and calcium. So we don't just order magnesium. We are getting a basic metabolic panel, so potassium and calcium are included. Now, pretty much any lab can uh, do it for you, can uh, get you serum magnesium. Now, any patient with recalcitrant hypokalemia and hypercalcemia should get their magnesium checked because this could be the reason for this recalcitrance. Uh, like I mentioned before, when we talk about magnesium loading test, it is rarely done, so you don't need to worry about it. Fractional excretion of magnesium is helpful because it's going to come down to, is it renal wasting or GI wasting? If the kidneys are wasting magnesium, then there are going to be more magnesium in the urine, increased excretion. Therefore, the fractional excretion of magnesium is going to be over 4%. 
On the other hand, if you have GI wasting of magnesium, like you have malabsorption, diarrhea, laxative intake, then the kidneys are going to preserve magnesium and fractional excretion of magnesium is going to be less than 2%. Same way we talked about it in uh, potassium. Normal individuals have FEMG, fractional excretion of magnesium, between 3% 3, 3 to 5%. Now, doing a 24-hour urine collection, and we said it has to be 24-hour urine collection, not a 12-hour collection due to the circadian uh, uh, rhythm with, with magnesium excretion, uh, is very helpful in distinguishing renal causes from extra renal causes of magnesium wasting. So the cutoff is 30 milligram per 24 hours. With potassium, we said it's 30, but not milligram, 30 mil equivalents uh, per 24 hours. So if your magnesium is over 30 milligrams, then you have renal magnesium wasting. If your potassium is over 30 mil equivalents per 24 hours, then you have potassium magnesium wasting okay so this is a simple test and can really uh, limit your differential diagnosis is the renal cause or is it the GI cause now medication review is critical like with any other electrolyte disorder and actually like with any medical disorder uh, is the patient taking a potassium binder like pterimer is the patient is on a proton pump inhibitor is the patient uh, uh, taking uh, a diuretic, for example, okay? Sometimes uh, you, you know right away what's causing the hypomagnesemia. Now, we order an EKG if we are suspecting cardiac arrhythmias because that requires immediate emergency treatment of hypomagnesemia with intravenous magnesium sulfate and requires telemetry. Now, if genetic hypomagnesemia is suspected, and usually this is going to be in children for the most part, um, Barter syndrome is mostly in children, Gittleman syndrome you can see in, in adults, you need to consult a specialist, usually a nephrologist, who's interested in these disorders, and really to ascertain the diagnosis, you need genetic testing. So nowadays, um, once you suspect it, you do all the initial testing, but uh, then you have to confirm it with genetic testing. I'm going to stop here, and uh, we'll continue our discussion of hypomagnesemia in the next lecture.